Pass my agenda or let me cut. That was the governor's budget message to lawmakers this week. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capitol View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues, and with me today is Kent Redfield, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at UIS. Professor Redfield, welcome back. Good to be here. And Bruce Rushton, uh, staff writer with the Illinois Times. Bruce, glad you're back as well. And thanks for having me. So we have a lot of ground to cover today. Let's jump right into it. The governor gave his budget address to lawmakers this week, and he proposed dueling budget concepts for the next fiscal year. As viewers know, um, and as we have covered almost every week on the show for the past about eight months, Illinois does not currently have a budget for the current fiscal year, but the governor is required to present his plan for next fiscal year. So it was an interesting situation. He gave lawmakers two options. Professor Redfield, what did he come out with in this kind of unprecedented situation? Well, he said either we need to work together to fix the budget, and let's be clear, the budget he presented in terms of kind of what he wants to do for 2017 is short about $3.5 billion. I mean, he's got a line in there that says uh, working together or, or executive management or something like that for explaining where the $3.5 billion comes from. And he would either like to get together with the legislature after they pass some version of his turnaround economic development uh, you know, uh, agenda and have tax cuts and, I mean, tax increases and budget cuts, or he would like the authority to go in and essentially cut the budget by changing statutory formulas for reimbursement, by delaying some payments or moving around some payments that are currently required by law in order to manage the cash flow over the course of the uh, of, of the two cycles. He wants that authority, extraordinary authority for both 2016 and 2017. And, and while we have allowed past governors to, you know, give them a lump sum, say, you know, distribute this amongst agencies, we've never talked about giving the governor the authority to rewrite statutory, uh, uh, you know, uh, formulas that are set in statute or the authority to suspend uh, transfers of money like uh, you know the local government distributive fund that goes from the income tax to locals and so uh, it's unlikely that the, the legislature would give him that kind of authority but uh, he was trying to frame it in those kind of you know, this either or kind of, 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 of uh, choice that the legislature was supposed to make. Well, in the proposals, we're both kind of short on the details, as Professor Redfield just said. Some folks might call them unconstitutional. I think the router people would maybe call it unconventional. But Bruce, uh, you know, what uh, did the governor really focus on as far as specifics? I know he wants to put some more money in education. He wants to whack a higher ed pretty. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I wouldn't call it either unconstitutional or unlikely. I would label it pie in the sky. Uh, because no matter what he does, you can't cut your way to a balanced budget given what, what we've got, at least so, insofar as I can see. I mean, and we've seen that with the number of decrees in court, you know, the courts will weigh in and that would force his hand. And so, uh, you, you know, he's got this on the one hand, the, the rock, on the other hand, uh, the hard place. And so I didn't see in his budget address uh, uh, an overwhelming number of specifics. I mean, yes, he wants to protect uh, K through 12, K through 12, he's always he's always said that, but I think he's also come out against. Well, I, uh, how do you how do you pay for that? He hasn't come out with that, and uh, he has said I think fairly strongly that he doesn't want to transfer money between districts, uh, which I think is uh, part of the plan that uh, Senator Menard had tried to advance and and it got you know a fair distance with it, but just couldn't get it over 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 the hill. So, uh, you know, uh, I think if I was higher ed, I'd be uh, very concerned. Uh, there wasn't as much talk I think about hostages. Uh, this time as, 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 as I think that, that he may, may have alluded to in the past. That doesn't mean that that won't come up again. Uh, and again, we've got a primary election looming next month. And so uh, I think it would be difficult to imagine any substantive pro progress 
at least until after the primary election day. And even then, I mean, we, we, it's, it's, history has shown that the state can kind of bumble along uh, absent a budget for, what, eight months now. Uh, the backlog of bills stands at $7.1 billion, according to the comptroller. Uh, an unnamed high source in the uh, administration of the most transparent governor in the uh, land by his own uh, claim uh, has said that the governor is not uh, uh, against perhaps borrowing to reduce that uh, $7.1 billion uh, backlog, which is not a very Republican sort of uh, uh, way of thinking, at least as we've come to know Republicans. So uh, we don't have a lot of specifics. And, and the $7.1 billion, I mean, that's, that continues. That, that is the real, I think, quote unquote, elephant in the room, because the longer that keeps rising, and it's going to continue to rise inexorably until they uh, reach agreement on a budget, uh, that's going to really put the pressure on to uh, enhance revenue, i.e. raise taxes, uh, to handle that. So uh, I think historically these budget addresses, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's Ron or it doesn't matter whether it was Quinn, it doesn't matter whether it was Blagojevich, Ryan, whoever, I mean these are DOAs. <laughs> these are just kind of the opening bid in the poker game. And uh, so we'll see how, what, what, what has to, you know, what, what, where we go from here. Uh, there really were never any real specifics that I could discern uh, during the last cycle. There was a lot of posturing. Uh, and, and things that, that everybody knew uh, kind of in, we're, we're really not going to go anywhere. And I don't see this uh, uh, General Assembly handing the power of the governor to make the cuts on his own. And even if they did, he couldn't cut his way out of this. So. Well, and you talk about the elephant in the room and, and definitely that backlog of bills. It's not um, when, when you mentioned the three point five billion dollars that this budget falls short. That doesn't even count that backlog. Um, do you feel like the governor addressed the fact that we don't have a current budget and these bills are piling up well through this plan or his address? No, I, I mean, there really was no kind of acknowledgement of the math that is just becoming overwhelming. And, and it's really two problems. We're, we're continuing to run the credit card. And if we run it all the way to the end of uh, this fiscal year, you know, now we're talking nine, ten billion. Assuming that we actually fund higher education, MAP grants, put some more money in social services, I don't think we can assume that at this point. The other is the cash flow problem. If we don't have an immediate infusion of money that involves, you know, gathering money for the first six months and being able to put it into this budget uh, into 2016, or if we don't give the governor the authority. Uh, you know, not to pay bills, not to transfer money, uh, give the governor the authority to fund sweep, then uh, it may be impossible to make the state aid payments to elementary and secondary schools, even though that's promised, even though we've appropriated the money. There's only, you know, there are things that have to go out. Uh, debt, we have to make pension payments, you know, the debt service, and so, and we're trying to pay something on a lot of these different bills, but we may get to the point where we have, you know, the cash flow problem, unless we can fix it with more money or with the ability of the governor to sweep money out of funds or to take money that's supposed to go somewhere else and put it into the pipeline, uh, we could be in a real problem when we get to the last couple of months of this fiscal year. Yeah. And, and I think that politically, not paying the state share of education, that's the bottom of the barrel. Or that's, that's, that's when you've hit bottom, because you start not being able to pay the schools. And that is, and, he, and Ronna recognizes this. I mean, that was one of the first things he did uh, after they failed to pass a budget the last cycle, was to appropriate to get the money together so that the schools could get paid. Uh, that's, the, I mean, that's worse than a government shutdown in my eyes, at least. Uh, uh, when, when, when Johnny wakes up and Susie wakes up one morning and, and they can't go to school because they can't, schools can't pay their light bills, that sort of thing, uh, that, 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 that is absolutely, that's, that's death to any politician that, that presides over a system that gets to that point. And that's likely part of the reason why the governor, um, you know, was talking about K-12 funding and saying, send me mm -hmm. that bill, send me that bill as oh, yeah. soon as it yeah. gets in the legislature and I'll sign it. Well, what happens if Madigan holds that hostage and, you know, turn about as fair play? Uh, uh, Madigan, I think, has already signaled that uh, uh, finding a new formula for education funding isn't going to be a priority for him. Instead of saying we're going to do something this session, he's talked about, well, we'll form a task force, which is kind of rhymes with back burner. So um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to be interesting that uh, to see if, if public K through 12 education becomes a hostage slash political football uh, uh, that, that that could be very interesting to see how that plays out 
Well, we, we've kind of covered option A, option B seems like both of them are somewhat dead on arrival, at least in their current form. But Bruce, what's option C? What might we see happen? Well, option C is something they're not going to do, which is, <laughs> <laughs> but what I think they should do is uh, really they should start t t listening to uh, folks like the Civic Federation and Ralph Matire, Matire, I always. Martiri. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, th these are the adults in the room here, and they, they have come up with here is, is what realistically needs to be done to get our way out of this. And, uh, and that involves, uh, uh, in large part, figuring out the revenue. Uh, 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 before the expenses, or at least simultaneously with the expenses. And that is what uh, uh, folks, I think, had thought when Rauner first came into office, there would be some sort of grand bargain that would be made. And uh, that, I think the hopes of that have been dashed. But really, if you stop and you think about it, I mean, and, and I, I keep saying this, but it's, it's, it's still as true as it ever was, Illinois' tax system is completely antiquated. It's backwards. It doesn't work for a modern economy. And so uh, the reason why we're in this mess, in large part, is because we refuse to uh, uh, modernize our tax system to start taxing things that everybody else does, such as services, uh, a retirement income. Uh, and so what you end up with is you end up with uh, folks in the middle, I think, oftentimes feel squeezed. Uh, because the property taxes are so high, because sales taxes, because you got to make up the difference that you're not collecting, you know, when you're not taxing uh, lawyers, when you're not taxing roofers, when you're not taxing uh, uh, automobile repairs, somebody else gets taxed because of that. And so uh, that should, in my view, be option C. Let's go back to the grand bargain idea and sit down and press the reset button and talk about both revenue and expenditures. It's not impossible to do that simultaneously. And you know, I think that it's uh, perhaps they'd be well advised to figure out how much money can we reasonably have. Figure that out first and then figure out how to spend it. And they seem to, there seems to be a, a movement that some folks want to do it the opposite. We want to cut everything to the bone and then figure out how to pay for it. Of course, the one part of this that we're not talking about yet is the turnaround agenda, which seems so far to have been the governor's priority is, you know, over some of these budget issues. Professor Redfield, what happens there? I mean, the governor spent a lot of political capital on these ideas. He clearly believes that they would help the state and help the budget. Uh, you know, what happens moving forward? Where can Democrats maybe find some compromise? Well, I, there probably are some things that can be done in workers' comp, in tort reform, in business climate. Uh, you know, the, the, the real stopper in this is collective bargaining. And if the governor is insistent on essentially eviscerating public bargaining for uh, public employees, and we're not just talking about ask me, you know, state workers, we're also talking about school teachers, placemen, firemen, you know, if, if he's adamant about that, then I don't know how you get past that. If, if, you know, if that's his bottom line, then it's hard to see how the a democratically controlled legislature is, is going to give him that. And then, you know, we've kind of, a, a year ago we were saying, well, you know, if we get these kind of, we do something on the turnaround, then we can fix the rest of this. And people were saying, you know, it's not going to be difficult. Well, it was going to be difficult a year ago. It, clearly it was. Now we've lost all of last year in terms of the ability to raise revenue, and we've been running the credit card for eight months. And so uh, if we did the turnaround agenda tomorrow, and said, okay, now let's do budgets, let's come together. Well, you know, the fight over what to put in or take out of the sales tax, the fight over whether you tax retirement income. When the Civic Federation ran their numbers and said, here's some severe cuts and here's how much money we need to pay off the bills and balance the budget and have a sustainable situation, they were talking $8 billion in revenue, you know, four, almost $5 billion in income taxes, more than a billion from retirement income, uh, taxing uh, food and non-prescription drugs. I mean, now some of that would come off after you paid the bills, but that is, you know, getting the legislature to agree to pass that kind of tax increase on top of severe budget cuts would be, you know, I mean, I know the governor claims we can do efficiency, we can do effectiveness, we can, 
you know, trim here, cut there, you know, and, and clearly there are efficiencies to be had. But anybody that pretends this is going to be easy once we get past the turnaround agenda is, you know, like I say, that, that was a fantasy a year ago. Now it's, it's even worse. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that Workman's Comp, that probably does have the best chance of, uh, of, of getting some movement. I'm not sure that he's made as good a case for some of these other things as having a direct economic effect uh, on the state budget. Tort reform, I think, is a good example. I don't know that he's made the argument as well as he could have that, look, if we do tort reform, that's going to improve the business climate. I mean, he could point to certain jurisdictions, Madison County being the, 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 the A number one that's it's been called the ju judicial hellhole, and, and with good reason. But, you know, it, it it's, it's easy to talk about tort reform in, 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 the, in the abstract, but you know, when uh, uh, your loved one ends up having the wrong leg amputated or something like that, and they say, well, we caps on that, you know, that, that, that's when it gets kind of, kind of, kind of more difficult to, for folks to swallow. I think the tax on food is an excellent uh, thing probably to consider, but again, you get this, this knee jerks almost reaction. Tax on food, that's like taxing air or taxing water, and it's like, well, no, it really isn't. If you stop and you consider that, um, uh, you know, uh, if I buy a prime rib, if I buy a, a, a filet mignon and go home and cook it, I pay no tax on it. Yet somebody who is isn't perhaps not in as good of economic uh, status as I, you know, am able to enjoy, they're forced to eat at McDonald's and they have to pay the tax. So uh, when you really stop and, and, and you think about it, plus uh, if you really, uh, uh, for if, you, if you are economically disadvantaged, if you are uh, low income, you get link cards, you get food stamps. And so uh, the, the poorest of the poor here are, would not be affected by tax on food at all, and that's often forgotten. The governor struck a little bit of a gentler tone in this budget address, especially when compared to last year's, and folks felt like he did that as well in the state of the state, but Professor Redfield, he took a move today that, uh, uh, or actually yesterday, that would have frustrated uh, a lot of Democrats probably. He's continuing to push for this concept of uh, the state taking over Chicago Public Schools. They initiated a probe through the State Board of Education into Chicago Public Schools finances. Officials at CPS say, well, most of that information is already public and on our website, and you can check it out anytime. Uh, what kind of message is the sending, and why, why is he pursuing this when the law will not allow the state to, to intervene at this point? Well, yeah, I mean, clearly, to move beyond just reviewing the finances of the Chicago Public Schools and moving towards a situation where the state would in sec essentially take it over, it would be in receivership, which we have done with other school districts, it would require a change in the statute, which the Democratic General Assembly is not going to approve, but it can you know, it is part of the narrative about, you know, things are bad in Chicago, bad in the public schools, you know, and, and therefore we need dramatic, we need big changes, you know, we've got to, uh, you know, get at collective bargaining, we've got to get at these, uh, you know, pensions, and so it becomes part of the of the larger narrative, and, and, and clearly the governor is also, you know, this fits into another thing that was in his address was that we're going to, you know, we're going to take another shot at pensions. Now, he didn't claim the savings up front like he did with the last budget. He said in 2018 we would have savings if Senator Coll Senate President Collerton's bill gets approved, but, uh, you know, so it's you know it is in, it's it's part of the narrative, but it's it's not going to have any any substantive impact. Uh, but but clearly, it's it's meant to get headlines. It's meant to put pressure. You know, who knows what they're going to find in terms of you know or, or how extensive this review is actually going to be. Yeah, and I think the explanation for that for that could be you know explained by looking at upcoming events in March and November, which is to say elections. I mean, th this is this is politics in, in my view. The, he has no chance of getting this through the, the 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 General Assembly. It's dead on arrival. It's as dead on arrival as anything has ever been dead on the planet Earth. <laughs> and, and so he's continuing to pursue it. And the only explanation for that is, is politics. Well, and that moves us along to the topic that we'd like to cover next, which is the primary, which is coming up soon. And we're seeing, Professor Redfield, a lot of money going into this primary. Uh, the primary races for the legislature this year are going to be a little bit more interesting than, than maybe they have been in the past because there are, some of them are functioning as kind of proxy wars between the governor and Madigan and looks like even former governor Jim Edgar is getting involved. Tell us a little bit about what's going yeah, on. And we have two different things going on. We have the normal kinds of fights within a you know an open seat and you know and and so is it going to be the moderate or the conservative republican 
backed by Dan Prof's Liberty PAC. You know, we've got those kinds of things going on. Or in Chicago, we'll have a, you know, we've got a fight that's, that's uh, you know, a rerun with Christian Mitchell, the incumbent, and Travis, the, the challenger that's about Chicago public schools and charter schools and a whole, you know, it's more, it's local sorts of things and the ward committeemen are involved. Then we've got these two high profile races, one in central Illinois, the, the 51st Senate involving Sam McCann and his challenger, uh, Bryce Benton, where you've got the uh, incumbent, uh, you've got the Republican governor coming out uh, for the uh, endorsing Benton, who is running against an incumbent Republican senator who voted against the, or voted for the arbitration bill the governor didn't want. Something you know, asked me one. And, and something asked me one. That's a, that's easily they're going to spend a million dollars between the two sides. And then up in Chicago, Ken Duncan, who voted, you know, was absent. In, he was out of town when there was a child care bill that was up and is, has pretty much, you know, gone to over to the governor's voted side. Voted against that arbitration yeah, bill. Yeah, he voted well. against, yeah, and voted against the arbitration bill. Now we're talking amazing numbers here. You know, if they spent everything, you know, this could be two billion. I'm, I'm sorry, two million, two point four million. I don't think they're going to spend. Which is a lot it. for a state legislative. Yeah, we've primary never. Race. <laughs> yeah, we've, the, the 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 previous record was about uh, a million two in a primary, and and uh, and so this would just blow all of those records away. And and there is, you know, there there. You know whether whether or not everything on the table gets spent, it's going to be far and away the most expensive primary. And we're playing this off. You know, if Duncan loses and McCann wins, then that's a big win for you know that's a big defeat for the governor. If the other thing happens, that's a big victory for the governor. And so this suddenly becomes all about uh, putting pressure on the legislature. And and so they're basically they're just proxy wars for uh, you know for for the the Democrats and the, and the Republican governor. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, uh, it's not as ugly as the GOP has gotten on the national uh, stage for, for the presidential race, but, you know, the gloves, tr I think, truly are off, and I think the SJR had a pretty interesting, Bernie uh, Schoenberg had a, a good column on this uh, just recently about uh, the governor chose a meeting of the Sagamon County Republicans to announce his support for Benton, uh, and they had already endorsed McCann, and so that's just kind of in-your-face stuff, and, and I don't know if that's just a uh, 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 naivety or by accident or the governor saying hey I'm the boss uh, but that that's that's uh, he didn't get win a lot of style points for uh, uh, doing choosing that particular venue uh, to make that announcement well and a lot of this money you're talking about professor if is that moving through PACs and kind of some do we, are we seeing a lot of kind of dark money situation yeah it's, going it's on independent there? expenditures and we know where some of that can come I mean we know where that comes from and so uh, Illinois go which is the uh, uh, is one group that's money going to Duncan? That's the supposedly Democratic uh, uh, s group supporting the turnaround agenda. Uh, but on the other side, uh, you, you know, Liberty Principles PAC, which is the primary one in the backing Benton in the Senate district here in Springfield. That's Dan Proft's. Uh, yeah, that's Dan pack. Proft's yeah. group. But it's money that came from the independent expenditure group. That is the Republican "quote unquote" independent expenditure group backing the turnaround agenda, and so we've got money being funneled in, and then we've got half a million dollars going to Ken Duncan from the Illinois Opportunity Project, which is a five uh, five hundred one three C or C three. And so that's a non for profit. We don't know where the money came from. They don't have to disclose, and so. Uh, it is probably conservative backers of the, the, the basic conservative agenda. Uh, I doubt seriously it's like the Russian mob or somebody moving <laughs> well, money it's in. Illinois. <laughs> but that, that, but you, you literally don't know where the money where the money came from. And so that's, uh, you know, that, that's just one more feature of what we've got going on. Well, and Bruce, you mentioned the State Journal Register. I kind of want to move to chat about that a little bit. Uh, it's the newspaper here in Springfield that's well known for covering state politics mm -hmm. closely, and mm -hmm. uh, they're going through a contract negotiation of their own. Uh, the the newsroom has unionized. When when did that happen? The union uh, the newsroom voted to unionize in the fall of 2012 by a vote of 26 to 4. 
And now they're negotiating with Gatehouse, which is the parent company that owns the SJR and lots of papers are around the country. Correct. Gatehouse, you used yeah. to work for the SJR. I did. We want to say that right up front. Correct. But you've been covering this closely. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? They're, they've kind of reached a point where they are they, agreeing yeah. on a contract. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> kind of it. You know, the first off, I mean, I think we should recognize why this is important, why this should matter to readers, because uh, the State Journal Register is the provider of, you know, one of the major providers of news uh, um, in this, in our coverage area here, and uh, they do have a, an excellent record of covering state government and politics. And uh, so uh, we should care about what happens to the State Journal Register. And what's happening now, the major issue, surprise, surprise, is uh, wages. Uh, they have gone without a raise now since Gatehouse acquired the newspaper eight years ago. Uh, that's eight years without a raise. And the companies f put forth a final and best offer uh, in January. And the wage proposal on that was a minimum of $11 an hour for part-time newsroom employees and $13 an hour for full-time newsroom employees. Now stop and think about that for a second. Uh, at that level, it wouldn't be surprising if some of these folks were eligible for food stamps and Section 8 housing, uh, depending on how large their family is. Um, what the concern would be, at least from, from my perspective, at that level of a wage, is what's the quality of journalist you're going to get uh, who's reporting the news uh, uh, to the Springfield area. And what that portends is this is not a destination for folks to come and be journalists and learn their beats. I mean, you get folks like Doug Finke, who's very experienced uh, uh, and has been around for a long time, knows the ins and outs of the State House. Uh, Bernie Schoenberg, same thing. Those folks will end up, I think, if this comes to pass, uh, as being somewhat dinosaurs, and we'll see a revolving door of folks, kind of young journalists coming in, just starting out, uh, getting enough stu uh, time on their on their resume so they can move up the ladder. And that's well, we already have been seeing that. And we have already SJR been seeing that. Uh, uh, and so, uh, what they've done now is the uh, union uh, unanimously rejected the company's final and best offer, and wages were the sticking point. The company had offered to pay $600 annual uh, bonuses. Uh, no, no raises, and that was contingent on an open shop. And this information, I should add, is coming from the union. I've sought comment from the SJR management, and they have not responded to my emails or inquiries. And so uh, we have to trust what they're saying. So uh, their last bargaining session was on February 11th. A uh, federal mediator is now involved. Uh, there has been no uh, um, uh, movement. Uh, the uh, union tells me their initial contract offer, they said, okay, give us exactly what's in place at the Peoria Journal Star. Mm -hmm. And uh, the union says that would have cost about a million dollars over the life of a three-year contract. They have since lowered that down to a point where their last proposal, I was told, would cost uh, the company $250,000 over the life well, of a three-year. Well, and I hate to cut you off, but we're almost out of I'm time. Sorry. What happens next? Nobody knows. Uh, the f the, the, uh, from the company side, they could seek an impasse and then impose working conditions. They haven't done that. Uh, from the union side, a strike probably is, isn't on the table. Uh, I think they're probably their best option would be to seek uh, boycotts either by subscribers or advertisers or both. Okay, and next time you're on the show, we'll look for an update from okay. that. Uh, I'd like to thank my guests, uh, Kent Redfield and Bruce Rushton. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn with Illinois Issues, and we'll see you next week on Capital View.